Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kelly Linder, the curator for the University Galleries, and thank you for joining us today for our public program in conjunction with the exhibition Wang Ju Lin Castings at the Library Gallery. I am pleased to introduce both the artist Wang Ju Lim and independent curator Cassandra Koblenz to you today. Lim's survey exhibition would not have been possible without Cassandra, mm -hmm. who generously introduced me to Wang Ju and her work um, about two years ago, over two years ago, actually. This serendipitous introduction led to a two-year collaboration and Wanju's development of a new large-scale installation and completion of the film Casting 2, both which are on view in the library gallery at this time. Um, it has been such a pleasure to work with Wanju, and it's hard to believe that the exhibition has actually been up for two months now. So we have one more month. Um, and it's just it's it, interesting to see the exhibition again and again because like the themes that it explores in terms of memory, things start to appear that even we didn't see before. So I highly recommend that uh, you visit the show more than once if you have the opportunity. And I am also really honored to call Cassandra both an inspiring colleague and a good friend. And I'm hoping that she will share some of um, the projects, information about some of the projects that she's currently working on in Southern California. So today I am looking forward to having the two of them explore ideas of architecture, site responsive installations, and look further at Wanju's integration of architectural and sculptural strategies within her multimedia practice. Cassandra Kroblenz has a diverse curatorial practice that champions the artistic process and forefronts creating meaningful, engaging experiences for audiences with works of art. As an independent curator and consultant, she continues to take innovative approaches to collaborating with artists, curating exhibitions, and building community. For six and a half years, she was senior curator and director of public engagement at the Orange County Museum of Art, where she curated the 2017 California Pacific Triennial, titled Building as Ever, and authored its accompanying catalog. She also designed and implemented the program concept of for the museum's temporary location, Aqua Expand, in Santa Ana, and curated 20 exhibitions within this framework and organized numerous public programs. Koblenz has curated more than 30 other exhibitions, including solo projects with Kristen Everberg, Jean Shin, Brian Ripple, Pei White, and Lyle Ashton Harris. In 2016, she curated Ellen Lesperance, Helen Murad, Traversing for the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, California. She has authored and managed the production of several exhibition catalogs and served as curator at the Museum of, or Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, as well as positions at the Hammer Museum, Dia Center for the Arts, and the J. Paul Getty Museum. She received her BA in Art History and English from Cornell University and her MA from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. She is currently, and this is a thing I'm hoping she's gonna talk about a little bit, lead curator of Transformative Currents, Art and Action in the Pacific Ocean for the Getty Foundation PST Art, Art and Science Collide. Um, for those of you that might not know the Getty, um, is it every four years? That they do this every two years? It has never previously been consistent, but oh. they're going to start doing them every five years okay. now. So they're going to start doing them every five years, but there's been two other iterations of the PSD program funded by the Getty, um, and many institutions throughout the Los Angeles, Southern California area um, produce shows that are sort of in line with the theme. And it's an amazing opportunity to see artists you may not have heard of, the ideas you have not even thought of. Um, so if you have an opportunity to be in Los Angeles during that time, I highly encourage it because there's a lot to see. That will be a year from now. Yes, a year from now. Fall 24. So anyway, her project, Transformative Currents, is going to be on view in fall 2024 at the Oceanside Museum of Art, the satellite presentations at the Orange County Museum of Art and Crystal Cove Conservancy. Conservancy. Transformative Currents examines the historical causes and ongoing effects of the cultural and environmental devastation of the Pacific Ocean and harnesses art potential, art's potential to enact positive ecological change, both planetary and local. And she's going to have works in diverse media by over 22 international artists. So, all right, on to Wanji. Wanju is a Korean American artist whose multimedia practice is grounded in the interactions of sculpture and architecture. Her work revolves around the play of real and fictional spaces in the construction of memory, longing, and fantasy, drawing upon both empirical and imaginary constructs that we rely on to move between multiple scales of interiority and exteriority. The conceptual and formal elements in her work draw from sources ranging from Baroque architecture, the urban landscape, to the domestic space. 
Her work has been exhibited worldwide in 40 plus solo and 70 plus group exhibitions, including those at the Elzig Museum in Istanbul, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the San Jose Museum of Art, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, the St. Louis Art Museum, Vancouver Art Gallery, the Hammer Museum, the Museum of Art Seoul, <laughs> and we could go on and on. So she has exhibited worldwide. So it's pretty incredible that we were able to have her here at Sac State. Um, her work is included in the, um, sorry, I lost my place, in the international public collections, such as the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the San Jose Museum of Art, the Minetti Schramm Museum of Art at Davis, Elzig Collection, and the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. And she has received also numerous fellowships and grants as well. So please join me in welcoming Wanju Lim and Cassandra Copeland. Can you hear me if I, do I need to hold it? I don't know. Can you hear it in the back? Do you want to talk? All right, yeah, I'll start talking and if you can't hear me, let me know. Anyways, thank you so much, Kelly. It's such a pleasure to be here um, with both of you and um, just a thrill to get to see this exhibition realized. Um, one of the really special aspects of getting to be here in conversation with Juan Yu and, and how I wanted to start our conversation uh, today is, is based on an ongoing um, dialogue that you and I have had for now over two decades. Uh huh. And yeah, so it is remarkable to me to get to see this exhibition realized and reflect on the evolution of your practice. So I thought that would be a good place to start um, and really to kind of think about the arc of, of your practice and, you know, looking back to the, the first works of yours that I uh, became interested in and how you were exploring issues around perception and consciousness through installations you were making then um, using uh, plexiglass and light and shadow to evoke the Los Angeles cityscape. And in some ways those processes or materials and certain explorations are still present in the work you're making today. So I wanted to ask if you could just share that, uh, your thoughts on that evolution with us. Um, you know, as you think about the context of this 15-year survey of your work and how the work is involved. Oh, That's well, a big question. That's such a big question. But, um, uh, I, and we'll I, get more into it over yeah. the course of the conversation at the jumping off. Oh, thank you. Well, anyway, thank, uh, also thank you to Kelly uh, for that really thorough and nice introduction. Um, and yes, uh, Cassandra and I have known each other for a while. And uh, she has seen my work. I think probably one of my earlier, earlier, earlier works, like early 2000, could that be probably right? Mm -hmm. And but I want to go back a little bit uh, in kind of addressing what you're asking about. Oh God, this kind of you know, um, kind of this life of my practice. Um, I uh, studied architecture as an undergrad, and I wanted to be an architect, and uh, that didn't work out because I just that didn't work out. But I love architecture, and I love. Um, everything that um, philosophical and theoretical and most, most of all experimental about architecture and I feel that everything that I want to do in architecture I'm doing and I have been doing for the last 20 some years so um, you know I have to say started uh, when I went to grad school so I took a few years after undergrad and then I went to grad school and um, I was my this is my first work the one documentation of Christian bedroom to the right is the first artwork that I really I made, and that was at Art Center. This is the mid to late 90s, and um, I did what I knew at the time to do. I knew how to make floor plans, and I knew how to make elevation drawings, and that's what I did. Um, so what you're seeing there is like uh, memories of all the past bedrooms that I've ever lived in, and so from you know. My relationship to architecture is one of, of kind of like maybe a practical one, right? You know, drawing, you know, elevations and, and floor plan drawings. And then immediately it went into, you know, um, kind of layering and uh, into memory. And, um, and, but still I felt like the, like the work was outside of the viewing subject. Now we were seeing these kind of panels of walls and, and 
it was not until maybe towards the end of my study at Art Center, and, and I was a little bit older student, you know, and, and I went to Marfa for the first time. I went to the Chinabi Foundation where they house the permanent uh, 100 uh, untitled work and 100, um, 100 untitled work in Mill Aluminum by Donald Judd. And there was like this pivotal moment for, for my practice where the viewing, navigating subject um, is implicated in the artwork and time and space and contraction and expansion of time is something that needs to be like a formal element in the work. And so I think that maybe might be the first um, kind of a, a moment when I um, started making like bigger installations. Yeah. And yeah. No, it, it, it makes me think of this idea of presence, which yeah. we've talked a lot about yeah. in, in the work, um, which I think it's interesting to, and when you think about your, your process of working and the, the way that you're using the material mm -hmm. as well. But I don't want to get too far ahead. I don't know if you wanted to, to share some of these other works. For or sure. Not, but, this is, um, yeah. but even, you know, these are, this is a work from 2002. Um, and your choices of, of working with light and shadow, for mm -hmm. example, as a, as a medium, mm -hmm. um, I think have a relationship to this idea of presence, right? right. And, and this um, sort of being in the space and the sort of, what, whether it's an idea of phenomenology, mm -hmm. something that Donald Judd was interested in. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, you can, but I think, um, yeah, maybe you can talk about that because I think it also is about time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about time and it's about space and you cannot talk about one thing without the other, obviously. And also, um, it's also about like kind of having a um, within the frame of the artwork having a democratic space and what I mean by that is not with minimalism not only did the art object get off the pedestal some of them look like pedestals right and so um, that is to say the sculpture is sharing the same ground as the viewer and this became really really important to me and this again was realized when I was like you know experiencing Donald Judd's work yeah um, and so yeah that's that's um, that became such an important element in the works so that the the body that's moving around the sculpture moving around and it's within inside of the installation then becomes somehow implicated within the whole setting and environment so, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I think to me, experiencing your work involves, it's almost like a, an unfolding, like a, in, in a, a kind of a turning inside out. And I think even the way you engage with both the presence and kind of um, in terms of the present moment mm -hmm. and one's presence in the present moment mm -hmm. with the artwork, but also um, you know, particularly in the current exhibition, uh, you're you're engaging both the sort of process of making models, the trace, the archive of the process of making, yeah. and the final object itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're they're displayed in a way that e they're equally important for the viewer and their experience. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that because this idea of sort of both creating a finished object, but then also revealing the works. Um, process of being created, almost pulling back the curtain on the sure. illusion that you're creating in the work. Um, sure. It's both, you know, preserving and recording, um, and making something permanent, but also disrupting that permanent. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's always shifting and evolving to a certain extent. Sure. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Though. No, absolutely, totally. Um, I think. I have to like kind of, and I'm gonna totally misquote this, but I was really interested in the way uh, the playwright and um, the theater artist, um, Bertolt Brecht, talked about um, what he told his um, actors to do is to act in the third person from the past or something like that. And this is to say, I took that as actors that are, and are, are art objects, right? That are in the process, maybe this is a, um, that in the process of acting, mm -hmm. you know, catching the act, actor in the process of acting, and and this is to say that um, 
this kind of fourth wall, as you were saying, the curtain, or the fourth wall that has been lifted and revealed, is not so much that the audience or the stage is part of the audience, it's also the audience reality then becomes part of the stage. That is to say, these things, you know, not, it's not just blurring the boundary, they coexist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a way, again, to kind of think about a democratic space, yeah, a it's space that's collapsing time. Yes. The past and present yeah. that are colliding in a way. Yes, yes. And, and within it too, right? So, an installation like this, you, you could be standing. Is that correct? But yeah, okay, so you could be standing right here, and then maybe you walk around, and maybe you look at the back over there, and you come around, and you come back to the same area, like maybe a minute and a half later, and you might experience something different. Yeah. You almost, it's almost always different. Oh, almost always different. Yeah. And sometimes it is because, you know, it literally changed. And sometimes it's accumulation of your memory for the last minute and a half that gives you a new experience of this, exactly the same thing. So the viewer's experience is like another element sure. that completes yes. this dynamic. Yes, and, and, and I could also further, I would add one more thing. So I think when you're experiencing the work by yourself, as opposed to with two other friends, then it becomes a different experience too, right? So I think all these things um, kind of add to it. You know, so everything is about that. with our friends to see what we do in that commission. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you're looking at your you're looking looking at your friend who is looking at you who is looking at the work. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of an exchange that happens that is everything is inclusive and that everything is um, uh, contingent upon each other, including the artwork and including the art object, including the lights and the shadows and projections and so on. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's something really interesting about the way you think of an art object that mm -hmm. has its roots in your relationship to architecture. So maybe we can um, shift gears a little bit and talk about that. Um, we're, going yeah. we're going forward, actually. Well, we can talk more about these if you want. Yeah. Um, and, and really think about the context of artworks about architecture and, you know, of course, they take many artists for centuries have made artworks about architecture. But um, when you and I were talking about our conversation and planning it for this discussion mm -hmm. here, um, thinking more about contemporary practices, um, I propose this idea that I kind of imagine there are sort of two ways of working that artists who engage with architecture kind of employ. And, one is artists who make intervention into existing architectural spaces, someone like Gordon Matt Clark or, uh, or Hans Hacke or uh, Daniel Buren, in this case, uh, Michael Asher. Or there are artists um, who represent architecture um, in their work. Uh, and, you know, and some are kind of blurring those boundaries as well. Um, I imagine your work kind of aligns with the, the group that represents architecture. And in this case, the way I see it is that work is often about history and time and memory. And um, I think that has a relationship to the way someone like Joe Hosea, for example, um, they're also thinking about different socio-political cultural circumstances of the time in which a specific building is created, maybe how history has been preserved or lost, um, and I think that is present in your work as well, yeah. that same relationship to history and memory, mm -hmm. um, the idea of, of trying to hold on to something that, that might be slipping away yes. or, or lost somehow, or is it maybe even intangible in the first place. Yeah. Um, and I think that also has a relationship to how you think of sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so these are all mm -hmm. wonderful examples <laughs> that Wanju has put together. Um, to kind of represent some of these ideas that I, I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on all of this. Sure, I mean, every, you know, and, and then there are a lot more, right? Yeah. This is just like, because I have to edit. Yeah, yeah, and then we edit it down and stuff, you know, but but I, I'm I'm very much interested in like what Kurt Schwitter did, you know, as he was kind of moving around, yeah, the very first the image. You talk, I'll, I'll um, run yeah. this line. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to give a whole lecture on like, you know, art and architecture by any means, but this is to point out that, you know, especially um, during the, uh, 
World Wars, wars and also during European avant-garde artists, right? They were using architecture as a way of, um, as a way, as a, as a kind of a political um, message, or not a message, but kind of a, a political move to, let's say, um, kind of uh, question the system, question the infrastructure, um, question the, the, the structure that's at work, and kind of rethinking about what is an entrance, maybe, you know. And then there was, and, and also like, you know, somebody like Carl Andre, whose work you could like step on and walk on. And this particular one is to go from the street and into the gallery space. He you created, had you had to walk on this and this idea of, um, and it was a, you know, I think it was a very much of a political movement. It was really, especially at the time, um, you know, um, really kind of a, a no-no to actually touch the work or step on the work, right? Um, but here you had to, so it became a really kind of a political statement about uh, what is art and who says something is art and what are the powers behind what goes into a museum, what gets not touched, what gets preserved and so on. And, and, and the notion of something, objectness, right? And ob something yeah. being a discrete object itself. Exactly. Yeah. Being, you know, something to view as separate from oneself. Right. Had, the experience of the work was the walking of Was the work. walking, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, and also with this particular work, I was really, I'm like, I included this because I think with this work, the idea of a sculpture as a place was something that was, you know, I don't know, I think it was born before that, but then it was like really kind of prominent here. Yeah. You know, how can a space that we never think about, right, that we walk through all the time, now becomes a place as a result of the, of the sculpture there. Um, and again, I don't want to give all that, but like yeah, this thing, but you know, like, like this is a good one to stop, you know, Daniel Baran and his idea of it in situ, and this, we were talking about this earlier during lunch, um, about architecture, um, architects were creating a big, big sculpture, right, and really having it so that it's really um, hard to install work or hard to experience or see the work and I think um, you know um, the Guggenheim Museum in New York is a good example of that and in the 1971 Daniel Biram put up this uh, painting sculpture piece and as a result he got kicked out because you know I don't know if anybody has been to the Guggenheim or remember how the space works but it's just like a series of spirals of ramp and um, as a result of him putting this right in the middle, um, the artist's artworks could not be viewed. And so in 71, he got kicked out. And then in 2005, he reinstalled, not reinstalled, he made a new piece at the Guggenheim. And I know it's hard to tell, but if you look at the floor there, you can see this mirror pyramid that goes up to the ceiling. Again, distorting the whole space. Um, so this is a way to kind of like, you know, um, it is a, a political move to re-understand this big sculpture made by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and so on. And so um, I guess I'm pointing to uh, these artworks, um, you know, uh, starting from the turn of the century during you know, European avant-garde, uh, different movements, but also then to, you know, American conceptualism and institutional critique where, you know, Michael Asher opened the Pomona um, uh, Gallery Right, at Pomona uh, College Project in Silent, and he just opened the entrance into, that's all he did, entrance into this um, gallery space where you could go in 24-7. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it's the, I think, literally turning the building itself yeah. into a sculpture. Yes, yes, and that's this is the, be, yeah. this is the former, the, the first um, kind of group that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, not that they're so separate by any means. Yeah, you know? I was going to yeah. say, there's, there's degrees of both happening in, in many of these examples. Like yeah. Dan Graham is a great. Yeah. I think he maybe falls into multiple both. camps. <laughs> both, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we have artists that, you know, that kind of um, were proved as uh, relational aesthetics. Right, Liam Gillick, Gillick is one. Um, he made a lot of installation work or um, sculptural works <laughs> where he put the work right in the, um, at the entrance. Um, so this kind of a, this area, the foyer, or the, uh, what is another area, like the entrance way, uh, lobby is, yes, um, where it's both a private space and a public space at the, at the same time. And this 
area become a, a politically charged voted space that has right. to do with what is inside, what is outside, who owns inside, and so on. The idea of public and private. Yeah. Or in, uh, yeah. That's, Oops. Oh, welcome to another example. <laughs> um, but this is another example of this Jorge Pardo um, piece that really pushes again the boundaries of public and private because it's a domestic building. Yes. Um, I don't know if you want to see more about why you want to include this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know. Um, we can talk about again. This is not a list of yeah. relation aesthetics, we but can just flip through these. I mean, yeah. I think the house that he lived in, mm -hmm. that he own, once owned with his um, wife at the time, now ex-wife, is um, was partially funded by Museum of Contemporary Art, and it is in a way a sculpture. But more than that, it is a house that was, I think, reviewed um, more by um, uh, architectural. Um, journals than art journals. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and I think thinking about that, the idea of a house as a form to push the boundaries of, I mean, I think someone like Gordon Mata Clark had an important impact on that as well, like the sort of what, what the sort of, this, you know, I don't know if it's an icon of a house or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever that might represent in a, in a more significant broader mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. You'll put it this one, I'm not sure why. Oh <laughs> um, yeah, I, love, I, I think it's because I love this piece, but also, um, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're uh, you know, the firm is a practicing firm. They made amazing, they, you know, did a lot of museums. And I really like this, this piece because it kind of questions what is a space and what is a functioning space. That is, um, they made this inflatable room that they could deflate and take it elsewhere, they inflate it again, and so on. And it becomes like this kind of a, in a way, a, a tumor, something that is part of the main body that grows, you know, and that kind of like um, the function of it that did not exist before the room inflated now exists and it has its own life and it's one that can kind of go away and then reappear and so on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, These are just other examples of yeah. different interventions into mm -hmm. buildings and, and kind of approaches to yeah. this question of a kind of hybrid kind of sculpture and building. No, no. Oh, did you, uh, if you want to stop, let me know. Oh, yes. So now I'm like kind of like, um, these are examples of artworks in which they're not as politically charged. I think they're all very political in a lot of ways, so I don't want to get too much, too much into this. But then I think these are, um, you know, kind of formal works, right? And what um, you were thinking about the second group in which the sculpture represents another place. Yeah. And sometimes that, in, in this case, it's, it's a, um, she made a mold of an interior of the stairway. Right. Or she made a, oh, do I have the other one? No, I don't. Um, you know, she often makes mold of the interior of a house, right. or something that's supposed the to be a negative space, like of using the actual uh, the actual home as a mm -hmm. to cast to cast, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's an actual place, but then now we have sculpture that's made out of the negative space. Now it becomes no longer a house; it can, cannot occupy it. You know, it's it, it, the negative became. A positive and solid, but now it becomes a sculpture based on an actual place. But then a lot of, um, like this one, De Hosa, that you were talking about earlier, it's obviously not an actual space, place, but something that is out of his memory, you know, um, and of another place that he could be accurate or not accurate, and, and memory to never accurate. And by <laughs> reproducing it or and representing it in this different material in a different form, yeah. oh. um, He's referencing, you know, this thing that exists in the world. Yeah. But he's making some. He's making something that is an art object. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I think is is somewhat aligned with what you are doing mm -hmm. as well. Not to skip too far ahead, but um, I don't know if you well, want to talk about these ones as well. No, but I don't want to. Um, too much. We could just, these are just examples. Yeah, and it, so. I wonder if you could also talk about the way that that you're doing that, the way you're kind of representing places mm -hmm. and I think you do that on so many different layers and levels both with models in your exhibition and you know objects within objects <laughs> um, and then sort of layers of rep uh, representation yeah, think, yeah in your work that is really interesting yeah um, and 
yeah, I mean, like, you know, there's some aspects of it, of my work that is like, you know, more closer to Dove's, uh, and there's some other ones that are like, like closer to Rachel White Reed's work, or um, I would say definitely Mike Kelly, he was my teacher, and I work for, you know, in the studio, so there's a little bit of that, and um, there's and a little bit... Skip over. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, you know, but, but um, I think there is this kind of a accumulation of of, of imagination and fantasy and memory. I think um, some of the artists that we showed are a little bit closer to representing something. Yeah. And I think um, the way I like to think about my work in, in, in relationship to representation, that like a lot of the works are more, or at least I'm interested in this kind of a sculpture that is a model of a place that may have existed out of my imagination and so on, that they're in this kind of a perpetual state of presenting itself, of um, constantly presenting and presenting act, an actor that is in the act of, you know, acting, <laughs> all right? This kind of a perpetual presenting itself. Huh? Um, maybe this is a good moment to turn more specifically to the new work and the way that you are I, I would love to hear a little bit more about your process of researching because there are specific buildings that you're representing yeah. in um, the new work with the sense of complexity, casting one, the left bedroom, and casting two. Um, so maybe you can speak about your process of, of you know, researching those buildings, yeah. how they informed the project in this process, or your process towards creating the, the new work. Um, yeah, and, and even the histories that they evoke. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason I, I would assume that the reason you are referencing and researching specific buildings is because you're trying to say something or explore something mm -hmm. about the moment in time in which these buildings, at least maybe, were created yeah, yeah. or inhabited. I mean, by your protagonist, maybe I don't know. I think like a good, I want to go back a little bit and I think we might have shown the image of like Ray Craft is dead mm. and also Girl Cat yeah. Shop. I okay. think these are like really good examples of this idea of a research, at least um, um, in my practice, it's not a, obviously I'm not a scientist, so I have nothing to prove or anything like that, right? So, you know, it's not about collecting like um, factual data. Um, it's a, I'd like to think about like research as a, as, as a lived experience. And I didn't know it was research. I, I just want to say this is a good example of it. Um, Raycraft is Dead are a series of works that's based on my relationship with now my deceased neighbor who once owned my property. And he was just this kind of a very intrusive um, person who came into my house and there were a lot of food going on and stuff. And, um, and it went on for 10 years, and when, when um, he died, I wanted to celebrate by making a whole body of work. That kind of like, re, I was rethinking about what was all the, the feud of 10 years all about, you know? And, and um, it was about, you know, the, the two houses, and it was about the property, and it was about like who owns that easement, you know, who parks there, and on, I could go on and on, super boring stuff. But what was more interesting was that the house, my house and his house, they know. I don't know the history of what has been happening and why he is the way he is in relationship to my house. I, I felt like it was never personal to me because he doesn't know me, but it was something about one has to do with like this new neighbor kind of coming into the neighborhood, but also and, and, and a very strong tone of xenophobia, this is for sure. But, um, but it was about like this, this, these houses that existed for a long time that witness all kinds of changes. And, um, and that's the research for me. My few agonizing, sometimes legal, you know, a few between um, Mr. Raycraft and myself was for me research. And only after 10 years, 12 years or something like that, I realized, oh, I didn't have to record all this. It's just all in here, yeah. right? And it's never about, you know, like um, kind of making work that is accurate to our fight or accurate to anything. So the body of work is about hidden places and hidden spaces in a domestic setting that becomes a source for anxiety and fantasy and imagination, which is like what both of us were doing, you know? Yeah. And it's just and kind house of. Was the thing that you? What did you say? The house knew it. Your house, the house. house is the witness. You yeah, know, like like a witness, as in like because the house was there before me. That too, but also it's a witness in that the recording is on the walls. The recording is in the plumbing. The recording of the house. You know, it's, it's a witness that that um, the the activity is 
bared on the body of the is in the architecture. Well, our domestic spaces are an extension exactly. of our of our psychological yes. space. I guess yes. yes, that's a big part of what you're exploring, also. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> So I'm just using this as an example, but Brooke Petshaw also was like this. The research happened a long time ago, yeah. but I didn't know, but only in hindsight, I said, kind of like, you know. Do you want to talk a little bit about the new work and sure. the buildings sure. that you're representing in them and, and that yeah. process of researching them? Maybe yeah. you want to um, share a little bit about the context and background sure. yeah. for um, the casting's work in general. Yeah. Um, and I'll get to the images. That first um, artwork that I ever made when I was a graduate student, the title of it is Proustian Bedroom. And it's this moment, I was really interested in this moment. And I knew about the literature almost like after I made the piece, or maybe in the middle of it. I'm sure somebody told, recommended that I read this. But that, I was not interested in illustrating Proust uh, or his writing or a, a specific moment of any kind. What I was really interested was um, this kind of sensibility, a Proustian sensibility that I was interested in had before I even read, you know, his, the first volume. And so, um, but this is to say, you know, it was like over 20 years ago, I've been like really interested in this kind of fluidity of memory. Um, um, there's so that much really represents. that Proust represents that um, certain kind of desire for an object that never is attained. This constant chasing, it's kind of again a perpetuation of something that could never be rested onto one thing or one person, one object, one place, one time, and so on. Um, and so I made different works, you know, not about Proust, but about kind of uh, putting forth some kind of Proustian sensibility. And this is maybe the beginning of the kind of casting series. I made a series of light boxes, and these are two, and I made more, but these are two of them. And I made a, um, a model based on how I read, how, what I remember about certain kind of moments um, in um, Swan's way. And so he was talking, going on about like the, the spire of the church, kind of like doubling and tripling and becoming one and so on. Um, and I made this model and I made an exact replication of it. And um, I could make the light box. And so the, the, the sculpture, the model, is inside the shadow box. And you, what you see, the viewer sees only the effect of the light going through it, lights on it. And so the light inside is kind of moving very slowly. Therefore, the shadows are moving very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and then after this was um, the test of complexity. Not after it, but no, that's not true. Casting to the film as part of the exhibition. Um, at the same time, maybe towards the end, I started making the sense of complexity that I finished for the exhibition. Hmm. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. And, and there's so many ways to approach unpacking this body of work because it has so many layers and they all kind of speak to each other in these different ways. Um, and I think, for me, I think a, a sort of important theme throughout all of them is that the idea of the way narrative works, but also complicating ideas around the subject. If, yeah. I mean, is Proust the subject, or you know, the viewer is the subject, or the other characters that you bring into the into the project? So, um, I don't know. Who would you say is the subject of, of, of this work? <laughs> I. I'm really interested in um, not just with this work, but a subject that has been one maybe damaged. This is to say that's fragmented, mm -hmm. that's been contaminated. Um, that's to say maybe it's both like fragmented and multiplied. So I'm interested in like um, multiple voices, and I think you could also kind of I think it's more apparent in the film casting too. Mm -hmm. Um, Are we? Yeah, but with yeah, so we could maybe talk about casting too if you like. But that, yeah. but then maybe also um, this is actually very good. Um, th these are works um, towards uh, the sense of complexity. The big installation um, in this exhibition, um, and I'm making you know in my studio, and I documented every single one of these um, characters. They're like how many did you count? Two hundred? One hundred ninety-five. One hundred ninety-five. And there were more, but some of them, you know, were not, they were cast it out, not cast it in. Um, 
All right. Okay. So I'll kind of like the subject here is definitely the relationship between the viewer and the art object. I know that it, this is like, you know, but that's how I kind of see it. And how do I, you know, I was like really interested in like, well, is there one, it doesn't matter if there's one viewer or 50 viewers in here in this case, but how can I create a, an installation where you don't really know where you are. So for example, if you're seeing a fo photograph of a beautiful landscape or something, somehow that image takes you there, right? Um, you are kind of virtually, you're kind of like placed there. Mm -hmm. And But can I create an artwork where you're both here and there at the same time? I think it happens, but I think, I think we all have this experience, like we have an amazing dream, and it almost seemed like it was a film or something, but then you wonder like, oh, was I me there? in that dream or was I watching myself be part of this narrative in my dream? And that's the thing that I think, I hope, you know, that 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 um, this installation could kind of create, you know, um, in, in a space where you're both in the fictional place that the installation creates and at the same time, you're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it reflects this what I start was saying earlier, this, this sense of an un unfolding, right? And, and I think also uh, this relationship, be, you know, this sort of dreamlike state that you're referencing it is about how you know, the inner workings of the complexity of representing the way our minds work on the inside, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and of unfolding that for a viewer mm -hmm. and kind of inviting them into mm -hmm. this space where you know, you can physically move through it in the world, but right. it is also a very internal experience. Mm -hmm. So that dynamic of that shifting back and forth between interior and exterior, yeah. I think is really fascinating. Um, and I think there's something about the relationship between, even the way you've installed the exhibition, right? That you first enter into this space that is, you know, you get to experience these objects, the way they're playing with the light and shadow, you move through this 15 year survey of your work and then you end up with this video that is in some ways pulling you even deeper, you know, inside. Yeah. Uh, uh. Um, which my experience of watching the video, I don't know if anyone else had this experience, it made me want to go back to the beginning uh -huh. and see the sculptures again. Uh -huh. So it's this sort of cycle of moving between sort of memory and interior and yes. exterior. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Anyway, I, I find that to be really fascinating. Um, and if you want to say more about um, the sort of confluence of inner and outer workings of the mind, and the way even a, a building can, or representing built space or an environment can, can evoke that. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, 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 the inner and inner and outer, both physical and, and virtual and mental is what you're talking about, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's because these kind of opposing ideas of what is public and private. So because there's a there's a dialectics that's happening here. That is to say, like you know, the outer is within the inner, and and, and the other way around. And the idea of a public cannot possibly exist without that without the idea of private, right? Mm -hmm. That these are not binary terms, but they're they're in a dialectical relationship. Yeah, and each other. Exactly. And they're and, and it's kind of it's again a kind of perpetual thing. It's not one or the other. And it's not like they're coexisting or blur blur blurry boundary between the two. That they're kind of always inside and outside within each other. Mm -hmm. And and I think I I like to work that out both in narrative and in, in, in the case with casting too, but also concretely, you know, that is a real thing in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, another interesting aspect of this body of work is um, the relationship to the body, actually, that the work evokes. Um, and within the narrative of, of the video, Casting 2, Bruce is dying, he's losing his bodily-ness, mm -hmm. and uh, his housekeeper, who is another protagonist, yeah. um, Celeste Alvare, um, she was her her role is as his caregiver, both of his body and then also a little bit of his mind, yeah. as far as I understand. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, her identity, you know, your choice to kind of focus on her and, and, and make her experience central 
in addition, you know, to his and um, and you know this this idea of her narrative, her voiceover is what kind of leads people through their experience of the video component. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in in a way, it kind of raises the question of who's in control right. of the world making. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the one that's it's her voice that's kind of reading the story or the images for us, or mm -hmm. at least presenting them in a way for the audience. Um, yeah, so I was curious, if, if there's a, a, and I think in the video you use sound mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. And her voice is, is a huge part of this sort of world that you're creating. So mm -hmm. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about her voice, the use of sound in general, and the sort of layering and mixing of sound right, right, in the right. video. Yes, yeah, so her voice being both the voice of the narrator and the voice of Celeste Abra, is, is that what you're talking about? I thought they were the same. No. Oh. Oh, wait, wait, no, wait. Let me. The, the script is based on a writings of both Proust and memoir of Celeste Abra, right. who was his housekeeper. So I think, he, yeah, yeah. But Proust. it's the same voice that's reading oh no there's different voices there they're, they're, there's yeah. a Proust yeah. and Albert together and th I mean that that's the thing is that they overlap right, right. and so you know although I read Proust before Albert at her memoir I got to know Proust from a third person you know that is to say like it's not directly from, from Proust and his memory it was through the memory of Celeste Albert like I got to know Proust's memory and what happened in his life and how he went about writing the novel, especially the last volume. Um, last volume because he was, you know, pretty much like um, he was in his deathbed and it was to a point where he couldn't even lift a pen. So, you know, he would dictate and she would transcribe and she actually, at the very last uh, volume, she was editing one for him. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 it's the voice of, of, of both writers, I think, that the script is from. Right, and so I'm interested in, the, in, in your choice to layer those voices mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. and the other elements of sound in the film because in a way it's mirroring what you're doing on a visual yeah. level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this sort of slippage of sound and image slippage, even that yeah. occurred. Yeah. If you could talk about that. Oh my God, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, they're very excited, you know. <laughs> so it is told through one voice, like physical voice. There's right. a voice, there's a reader, a voiceover. And her name is Isa Lee. And she is a Vietnamese American whose first language Vietnamese, was Vietnamese and then um, French and then English. And she lives in Orange County <laughs> that you actually introduced me to. She's the president of the Vietnamese American Literature Association. Yeah, I remember. Yes. Well, because when you were first working on, on this, this video project and we were in a conversation about it, not to, to change the subject mm -hmm. too much, but you were interested in um, the sort of cultural background yes. of this, this historic figure, yes. Celeste no. Alvarez, yeah. and, you were, and, and you were specifically seeking someone mm -hmm. who had that heritage mm -hmm. to, you know, represent the complexity of this yeah. person in history yeah. and her position relative to Proust and France and yes. colonial history and the relationship exactly. between France and Vietnam. And right. so that's very subtle, mm -hmm. um, but I think important aspect. Yeah, her. I think her, yeah. her Vietnamese and French really comes through when she's you know speaking English, definitely. Yeah. And so it's both the, the, the residue of the person, but also the residue of France and Vietnam um, relationship. and. Um, uh, the, the, the colonial past, recent past of Vietnam, but I wanted to use this particular voice because somehow it reflects um, this kind of a, um, a speaking through something. You know, the, 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 the narration is you hear Celeste Alvarez through Proust and you hear Proust through Celeste Alvarez in this, in this um, video that I made. I think for me that was really inter you know, important that the narrator had to have a certain kind of accent, and Vietnamese French accent seems to be the right one, obviously, for, for obvious reasons that it's uh, you know, talked about. Um, so that is the voice. But the sound also, well, I'm sorry. But, yeah, no, 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 go back, go but, 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 um, there's So there is the narration, the voiceover of this film, but there's also other sound elements, right? Such as mostly, um, yeah, mostly this kind of like a soundtrack. Um, yeah, you had music specifically composed. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Tell us a little bit about Yes, it. sure. So 
in my research. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, I was, you know, um, I was really interested in uh, adding a soundtrack um, that somehow spoke of that time, but also about time in general. I, uh, in my research, I found out that uh, Cesar Frank is a composer that um, Proust was really into, and one of the last things he did was he invited the strict quartet of Paris at the time into uh, his house and had, uh, had them perform a composition by Cesar Frank, and the two um, audience members were only uh, Albert and, and Proust. Mm. And so I, took, I researched to find out like, which exact composition that was played there. And I took certain parts of the score and I compressed it so that, and this is not exactly right, but so that like, three minutes might become three seconds, or that three minutes become 15 hours. And so what you're hearing is the actual play is just been stretched and compressed, much like our memory gets stretched and compressed. So that's the, the soundtrack there. So, yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, again, this same kind of way that you're interested in, in moving back and forth between the past and the present and this sort of conflation of time, yeah. you're enacting that with mm -hmm. the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. um, well, the other thing I wanted to ask in terms of the video is uh, the second part of it, which <laughs> I, I loved and was like a delightful surprise <laughs> as, as I you know, saw the, the final product of this video, um, you know, it, the movie, it's like movie credits, right? And you are, which is interesting, again, when we think about who the subject. <laughs> I don't think I, <laughs> I, the I, star, I don't think I ever asked you. You did no. We can right. back to it maybe here. <laughs> no, I don't know if I have an answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, there is no one answer to any of these things. I think that's what's interesting about your work is that you're you're raising questions and exploring things, and and it, we don't need to have a definitive answer necessarily. But um, but I do love the way you are forefronting and really um, there's a little bit of humor and playfulness to yeah, it, yeah. I would say, which I think is also present in other aspects of your work. <laughs> Um, yeah, but maybe you could talk a little bit about your strategy and why you wanted to end the video this way. Um, oh, okay. And maybe you could, I don't know if everyone knows what we're even talking about, but I don't know if you can see in this slide here, it says female figure two, color inkjet print on acetate sheet. So yeah, maybe explain yeah. what so, you did and why you did it. <laughs> the, whole, uh, the whole film is about 40 minutes. And a good um, 20 minutes is it almost broken into two, uh, two parts. One is the you know, voiceover narrative um, that we were just talking about. The second is the credit scene. I make the credit scene just as long as the narrative scene. And um, you know, even with the, with the, we collected so much raw footage for the narrative part. And um, after asking my um, the video, person to the camera person so many times to reshoot and reshoot and reshoot about three four maybe five months later I said can you come back and reshoot and we shot re twice more um, because I had to do the credit scene and once I started thinking about well who are the actors of course you know the models the sculptures are the actors all the materials that play their part in the shadow play that is this this film uh, they're the actors and they come to life as a result of the light and so the way I was talking about let's say for example stretching the score um, what I'm doing is I am taking the real thing and I'm abstracting it you know that is to say like the relationship between representation and abstraction is not one that's opposing right it's one is within the other so I'm taking something that's recognizable and or audible and I'm like stretching it so that it becomes completely defamiliar and you could call it abstract and I wanted to do the same thing with the characters like how you know it, I call it taking the bow scene right the characters come back and they play themselves you know they're they're caught in the act of acting as they're taking the bow and I you know just like did this kind of thing where like okay I know that you're a bottle I know that you have all these like you know drops, but but what happens when you 
you know, kind of are acting on stage and you're taking a bow and I started moving around the lights and then it started showing me, it's, in, it's just abstracting, I'm pulling from the original object and I'm witnessing something that I've never seen before and it was telling me, well, I'm also made of this. I'm also, I also look like this when you shine a light like this. I, you know, you think I was just something that looks like a cathedral. I have all these multiple faces. And it was showing me just by me playing with the light and I captured that today. I love that. <laughs> you know, I think you bring a sense of wonder to these. I mean, I think that's what's so amazing about the experience of the work, the physical um, sensory experience of it is the sense of wonder that you have that you can take something like a bottle or, or a piece of <laughs> glass and, you know, using light or, you know, the way you're positioning the camera and just that openness yeah, to exploring yeah. it. Um, I think I think there's something that is really meaningful. And um, when you and I were talking about, um, you know, planning this conversation and all of the, there's so many rich and specific references to Proust, to architecture, to history that are, you know, all of these layers are, of course, in the work as we've been discussing, but the physical experience of the work is also really central mm -hmm. for you. And yes. so I thought that might be an important element for us to, to talk a little bit yeah. about. Um, and in a way, it's, there, you know, what we were talking about, there are different kinds of knowledge making, yeah. right? There, There's ways of, of sort of studying and researching actual facts or, or inventing a narrative even um, that has this sort of specific tangible thing either in the world or in your imagination. Um, but then there's just the sort of, uh, I don't know what's going on, the, just the sheer experience of it, the physicality of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on mm -hmm. these different ways of sort of knowing and, yeah. and being in and around the work and, and I yeah. guess in the world? <laughs> I, I think like, I'm there are all sorts of artists and I don't want to speak for artists in general or something, but I think I need an excuse. I need, you know, and, and if it's Proust, my God, that's a good excuse, right? And, and maybe nobody has read Proust and maybe nobody's even heard of Proust, but I, I hope when you see the installation, you um, at least experience a certain level of Proustian sensibility, you know, so that uh, they, they're my interests and they're just interests. I could have a good idea, but good ideas are not art. They're just good ideas to me, <laughs> right? Often I think like stupid ideas become fantastical, amazing artworks. I really <laughs> do believe this. I've seen a lot of them, you know? <laughs> and, um, uh, and so I guess, you know, ideas or concepts, they just, they just remain that and they're only that until they become an artwork. And these are not the same thing. And so this is to say, if nobody knows George Raycraft here. I don't, I'm pretty sure nobody knows, and nobody had a fight with him. Why would you, right? But, <laughs> but, but you could look at the work, and you could see what the work is showing you that has to do with hidden spaces that creates fantasies and anxiety. You know, this is this is where I think like research and knowledge and all of that that's specific to me um, comes through in the work and. I cannot say it, the work has to say it. Does that make sense? I want the work to say it. <laughs> I don't want to explain anything in a way. I mean, we're having this conversation. Of course I share and I you know, tell you what I was doing when I was in grad school and stuff, but um, I hope the work is a lot louder and more articulate than me. I hope. <laughs> I think that might be a good place for us to okay. end our conversation and maybe open yes. it up. I wanted to make sure we left some time for any questions that you might have. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from out there? There's so much in there <laughs> to talk about. I keep thinking of the image in the film of you, your hand, right? Isn't that an image in the film? Yeah. So I keep thinking of that image as something really pivotal to the whole show or this whole body of work in, in a way. Um, in the sense, I don't know, it's like so many things I want to say. Uh, you know, you're dealing with, you know, sculpture, which the tradition is something very much about permanence. Yeah. And architecture is this other thing that's very much about permanence, yeah. like place, like like, I always think of the, the very traditional ideas of them, but 
your your hand in there, you know, at these models, it sort of like in, in the use of light just kind of, you know, blows that sensibility out of, you know, of of that that's more of a fantasy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This idea of this like permanence of this this I don't know, I think what is that like to dwell is to be the dwelling and being the idea. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's like I don't know. I don't know if there's a question there, but um, something to do with the hand, the hand in there is like mm -hmm. playing with these ideas, literally playing with them. It's the same as the art object that's part of the film. I, you know, the hand is also in front of the camera and it's caught in the act of acting. Yeah. And I, that's so that maybe that's the way I kind of think about it. Yeah. It's also I, like, you know, you make it, you make it evident that like this effect is being created because of this little light that's here, yes. right? Oh, this is like, this is, what is it, 18? No, it's not even 18, it's like candlelight from long, long time, I don't even know what, you know, but the, the beginning of fire. That's the technology. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's part of this installation. Yeah, and, and, and putting those things that, um, this sort of finished object, but also it's making and, and the illusion of it, right, on display, concurrently and in relationship to each other. It, it's, um, I'm doing some research about shadows and the history of shadows. And um, hopefully, you know, I could, like, I would love to make a, maybe the next large project, maybe it'll happen two years from now, maybe it'll happen 10 years from now, uh, would be to like make a kind of a uh, essay film on the history of shadow. And the first time the shadow was, uh, representation was talked about, was through the story of by uh, Pliny the Elder, the Roman, um, and he talks about this this uh, female who, uh, because uh, you know she's her lover's gonna go away, and she wants to keep his body next to her, puts him against the wall and lights a candle, and it traces and her his shadow, and thus this is the birth of representation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. <laughs> Would you address Plato in the shadows in his the cave? Also? Yes, yes. That the, there's, you know, it's something about like, I, mean, I read this um, great book actually. Maybe that was the kind of the beginning of my research. But the writer talks about one. Um, you have, on the one hand, you have the the origin of of representation in the shadow. On the other hand, you also have. Uh, through the shadow, the origin of knowledge with Plato. So there's this between representation and, and, and shadow, thus becomes like this kind of birth of Western, um, you know, Western knowledge or Western civilization. The questioning even of what art can be, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The sort of foundation of like, you know, and also at a certain point, you were also mentioning this question of what is an art object, what is the real thing versus the representation. Yeah. Yes. Representation yes. and maybe delusion or delusion is a good one too, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, there definitely in, in, in this sort of dreamscape that you create. There's, there's. I mean, we haven't even talked about like you know sanity, insanity, yeah. rational thought, irrational thought. But like, it, there's elements. I have to say, this is as rational as it gets. <laughs> that is to say. They're, it's not even a virtual, it's a real thing, it's not a virtual thing. Yeah. yeah. And so the shadow. This light is, is real. It's real. <laughs> it's right there in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a two part question. I might have missed in the beginning. Uh, did you explain like, how the thought process of like casting in a shadow, like I'm going to build something and then shine a light on it, and it's going to hit the wall, it's going to be this really cool thing? Or was that an accident? Or was there, did you have a concept in mind? Did I miss your explanation of that? I mean, I um, no, 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 no. It's not. It. You asking where did it start? Yeah, like how was it that you said I'm going to build something and shine light. a light on it? When I was three, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really? Like yeah, I, I understand. Said you messed no, up. and I don't want. Yeah, it's, it's like you know, there was a moment. And I don't remember this moment personally, but I'm sure there was a moment when I realized, oh, I have a body separate from my mom's breast. Like, oh, right, there must have been a moment in the baby where, like, oh, look at me. I'm, you know, the Khan talks about the mirror stage, right? <laughs> like, I am me, and I'm not her who's holding me into one, right? But then there must be maybe not, not too far from that, 
where um, I started playing with Shadow. And I remember being fascinated with Shadow. I think a lot of kids are at a certain very young age. And they become really big when they walk away from the source of the light. And they become really small. And I think, I think, um, I'm not, it's, a, it's not so much an explanation right. by any means, but when you say, like, how did this happen? I think it happened when I was really young. And I think it happens to all of us when we're really young. And we believe in this, and right. it is a real thing, right. you know? And we start creating stories and stuff, and then we get older, we learn the rules of society, and then we forget these things. Kind of get out of the box mm -hmm. and create things. I've never even seen anything like this before. <laughs> and, and another, I think it's really cool. And another thing I was thinking about as I was viewing your art downstairs was the fixtures moving. And I thought, I wonder how the perspective would change if you had a larger piece and the light moved around the piece and the shadow traveled around the walls had like in that regard instead of the fixture moving in the shadows mm -hmm. this big spot had did, have you tinkered with that kind of stuff yeah 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 um yeah um, oops i'm trying to get to this really yeah. fast where is 24 seconds of silence oh in the very beginning but no right, we'll go this way slideshow yeah sift through I'm pretty sure I have it. There, yeah. So this is a huge installation with lots of uh, sculpture components. Uh -huh. And there are five video projections. And two of them are on this uh, revolving um, platform. Oh, that's cool. And, and it's the projector, not a, it's a light. Right. Of, it's a projector. So the, I've been a couple of those. That's where, really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Any other? questions out there? Now's your chance. <laughs> well, if you haven't had a chance, I invite you all to come to the gallery. Um, the exhibition is up through December 8th, I believe. And gallery hours were open Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 4, and then on Saturdays from noon to 4 as well. Um, we are going to be heading back there, so if there's anyone that actually wants to come in for a little bit to see the show, I'm happy to open the doors and let you come in. But I do want to thank you all for coming today. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. <laughs> so, thank, thank you. Um, and when you have about, um, thank yeah. you, Cassandra. <laughs> I think you want to. <laughs> um, if you have, uh, you know, about whatever, 30, 40 minutes, maybe during lunch or something, check out the film and check out especially the second half. Yeah, we were talking about. <laughs> That's my favorite part. Yes. And also, I just need to shout out that we got a really great review on Square Cylinder. So if you're online and want to look it up, <laughs> I suggest you read it as well. Thank you.